Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor of catching up with our good friend Brian Brumberg. Yay! Where? <laughs> hey so, man, it's great to see you. Oh, so good to see you. Brian, the last time we chatted was 2018. We had a great conversation there, and of course, the world has turned quite a bit since we had a chance to chat, and yeah. we're getting together today because... You're on the verge of releasing, at the time we're chatting in March, in April, a new album I'm very excited about, titled La Faro. Yes. I just got the CDs yesterday. Oh, Literally. very cool. There it is. Yeah. It's so cool. It's like, holy crap, it's real. Oh, my God. It's a tribute to the legendary Scott LaFaro. And I can tell you about how, how it came about, if you'd like to know the way Absolutely. it happened. Because it's... It's another one of these projects that I've done, which was absolutely not my idea. <laughs> it came from my buddy, Susumu Morikawa from King Records in Japan. And he's brought me a lot of projects. And, and I've done a bunch of records that I never would have done if it wasn't for him mm -hmm. bringing these ideas and things like that. And, and I like the Jocko record that I did was his idea. Jimi Hendrix record, he, he, was, he was behind the Jimi Hendrix record. So these tribute records, and, and, and he's been behind many other ones that I've done. But... When he came to me with, with this, it was like, it was interesting because like for the Jocko record, my role of what that was supposed to be was I was just going to produce it and play on one song and I was going to have nine other famous bass players play on it and they all bailed out on me and it became literally, and, and it became my record by default because nobody would play on it. <laughs> so that's how that record happened. And then the Jimi Hendrix record happened when he's like, man, you should do a Jimi Hendrix record. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> I'm a bass player. What do you mean I would do a Jimi Hendrix record? I love Jimi Hendrix. I mean, I'm a huge Hendrix fan. The guy was brilliant. But I'm a bass player. What the hell am I going to do a Jimi Hendrix record, right? And I guess he knew more than I realized, you know, and, and I guess I took him seriously and I did it. And I love the record, you know, but it was cool because it was a Jimi Hendrix record. So I didn't have to think about the bass world. It mm -hmm. didn't matter what I did on it. It was a Jimi Hendrix record. I'm honoring a, a great musician who happened to be a guitar player. You know, the Jocko thing was different because it was a bass player. Well, Scott LaFaro, same exact situation. My, you know, Susumu in Japan said, you know, would you consider doing a uh, Scott LaFaro tribute record? And I was, my immediate reaction was like, wow, uh, no. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, thank you. Thank you for thinking of me this way. But, you know, I don't, I I just kind of don't want to, I just kind of don't want to touch it. You know, the jazz police and the bass police are going to kill me if I do this. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like, no, nah, I, you know, and he's like, well, you know, Brian, you really need to think about this because, you know, you really should do this record because you can, this is like your thing. You should, you should do this. And I'm like, man, all right, let me think about it. But you know, I, I, I don't know. So what I ended up doing was I took it seriously and I, I thought about it and I started listening to, you know, Bill Evans of the Village Vanguard, 1961, you know, and I started listening to these records and, and listening to Scott and, in you know, in, in all this incredible music. And I realized it's like, oh my God, he had so much more impact on my playing than I realized because mm -hmm. one thing that Scott, what, what Scott did that no one had ever done before was this incredible creativeness and virtuosity and expressiveness and just freedom in improvisation. No bass player played like he did. He also was like, he wasn't like a thumper straight ahead four on the floor guy like Ray Brown or, you know, Buster Williams or like, you know, like the real, like, you know, straightforward playing. He like took, it was like time was a, a serving suggestion. <laughs> he just, like, he just like floated, you know, and it's like artistically, I, I, I really understood his vision, but that wasn't my thing. I, I like playing walking bass line and playing the time and swinging and playing the groove and bam, 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 you know, mm -hmm. but his soloing and his artistry and his joyfulness and playfulness in his playing and his physical ability to play what he did back before there were good pickups and good amps and good bass setups and things like that was remarkable. And and, and in listening to these great old standards, it was just like, man, I grew up playing all these tunes. And I not only did, not only did I grow up playing all these songs, I, I grew up playing all these songs from this record that he was on. Oh. And it wasn't until I realized all of that connection that it was like, oh, my God, he really had an imp in input into my world. So, yeah, I'll do this record. And that's when I went back to Japan and said, OK, I'll do it. You know, now that I realized how much of a part of my playing 
he inspired me to be, even though I don't sound anything like Scott LaFaro in any way, he really inspired me because what he did was so far ahead of his time and so brilliant. So that's why I ended up doing the record. And I'm really proud of it. I'm really glad I did. You know, at first I was like, oh, man. And then it was like, this is just incredible music that I grew up with. It's like, how can you not how can you not love it? It's like great standards and great tunes. It's it's wonderful. You know, so we did it. We did it live in two days. Wow. 14 songs in two days. I made one punch of something that I completely screwed up. I don't remember what it was. Every solo, everything you hear, all of that was all cut live in two days, 14 songs. And the only thing that I did at my studio was the solo piece, Danny Boy, because they wanted me to do that because Bill Evans did that and dedicated it to Scott after he passed. Mm. And I didn't even know that Bill did that. And, and you know, the, the label sent me that and said, please do this. And I listened to Bill. I was just like, oh, my God, man, he's ridiculous. He's changing keys. He's doing all this amazing stuff. I said, I don't know if I can do that, but I'll do I'll, I'll do it. I'll figure it out. And then I did that in my studio because I didn't want to waste the other musicians time by doing it where we tracked it in a studio with the piano and drums and all that kind of stuff. But it's a real jazz record. 14 songs, two days. It was so rewarding and so much fun. And, you know microscopic little arrangement changes here and there. I do little things. I don't I don't do big huge arrangement changes most of the time. I do little things that make a big difference at least to me. Mm -hmm. So we just we just you know ran through the stuff, talked about it, boom, hit the red button and hit it. Did a couple takes and moved on to the next song and that was it. It was really fun. Nice. Well and one of the key things and I'm glad you mentioned it is you weren't shooting to try to replicate Scott's playing. You we're, we're kind of working within it's close, but it's still very much you. That, that's that's what, what I was getting. Yeah, and thank you because that's the intent. I don't, you know, why try to replicate what someone did organically? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need to. You mm -hmm. know, it's like when Jocko came out, 5,000 bass players wanted to sound like Jocko. You know, there's room for 5,000 bass players, but there's not room for 4,999 <laughs> bass players that are trying to sound like Jocko and they don't sound like themselves, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's the key is that you want to sound like yourself. And I did not learn one Scott LaFaro lick. I did not learn, I didn't play anything that he played because why would I? It's, it's, this isn't about, you know, this isn't about me trying to, to, to do what he did because, A, I couldn't be – it wouldn't be honest if I did because then I'm copying something else. And and no matter what I copied from him or tried to replicate from him, I would never do it like he did it. So what's the point of doing it? And and I think one of the things that, that makes it so important for me but also so rewarding for me is – is that it does sound like me, um, you know, maybe, maybe an older me, maybe, a, you know, a more tired me, <laughs> you know, I, had, I ended up having COVID twice, it completely kicked my butt, it triggered Epstein-Barr and mono, and I couldn't even move, I couldn't do things for, for months, I, I would leave the water running, the stove on, my mind was just gone, oh, I was scared oh. to death, I told my doctor, I think I'm dying, I mean, it was that bad, so I didn't even know I could even get through two days of recording, that was the first real recording session that I'd done, so I'm like, amazed that I could get through the recording and had the energy to actually do it. And I wasn't playing, you know, so to get my chops up, at least enough to record, you have to kind of know what you're doing if you're making a record. It wasn't like I was doing gigs and working on music and stuff like that. I'd basically been, you know, tr just trying to stay awake half the time. I mean, I, I know this is a little off subject, but it's the truth. I would be recording in my studio I'd be playing electric bass. I'd be sitting on sitting in a chair, recording, watching Pro Tools, and it's red. I'm recording, and I would fall asleep while I was recording a bass part, and I would wake up to just empty tracks of Pro Tools running because I literally fell asleep while I was playing and recording. Because from being sick, when you have when 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 COVID does what it does, you just go out. That's what my world was, Come you know, on. so it's like, how the hell am I going to play upright bass and get through this record? So that was really important for me. And I'm glad that I was able to do that. But I didn't I couldn't possibly sound like Scott LaFaro. So why even try? So I need to sound like me. And and you can hear the, the, the only thing that I would say about anything about me that would be influenced by him was hopefully the freedom and the improvisation, hopefully the ability to play melodically, the ability to 
have the technical prowess to be able to play those lines and to do those things. That's where you can hear Scott's influence on me of how he approached playing lines and how he approached playing in the upper register. He's one of the first guys to play in the upper register. Mm -hmm. We're talking 1959, 1960, 1961 when he passed. Yeah, you know, yeah. I was I was I wasn't even a year old when he died. You know, and this guy was like soloing in the upper register. Who did that? You know, so that's what inspired me. So I think on my, you know, yes, I sound like me on the record, but I think you can hear the influence of trying to be lyrical and melodical in the upper register. Absolutely. Well, and one of the things, if I didn't know, knowing the story about kind of where you were health wise all before this, listening to this, I, I would never know. For me, you're firing on all cylinders. And, and, and full bore because, again, track after track after track, I'm just like, oh, my gosh. And compared to the last, because one of the last time we were talking, you, it was on a funk album. Yeah. This was such a diverse change yeah. in direction that, again, I, I'm always in awe and I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> because this was so different and so upright. I grew up doing, I mean, man, you know, my first gig, I had a... a you know, I, I had I had another I had a deeper connection with the Bill Evans trio and Bill and, you know, Mark Johnson, who I hung with Bill and Mark in, in the trio. And, you know, Mark was the guy who recommended me to Stan Getz seven months after he met me. And I was 18, wow. you know, and then that opened the door. And that's how I got my first gig with Stan Getz, you know. And but that all came about because of Bill Evans you know, and hanging with Bill for a week and, and my biggest musical regret in the world. I can't believe th that I did this, but I was young and insecure and it just shows that you got to own your world. Mark w w was like, pushed me and, and like pushed Bill. He's like, yeah, Mark, Mark arranged with Bill Evans. Bill was going to let me play an entire set at the Village Vanguard with him on the Sunday night, his last night of his gig. Oh, I could do an entire set with Bill Evans. And I was too insecure and too chicken to do it. And then he died not that long afterwards. And Mark, Mark had hooked that up. And Bill was like, yeah, man, I know Brian. I love Brian. He's great. Have him come play. I'm like, what? I freaked out, man. I was like, mm. I'm, like yeah. I'm nervous. It's like I just couldn't. I, you know, I, I was 18, 19 years old. I don't remember what it was. But I, I, I was so freaked out. It, it, just, it just took me out. But could you imagine if I could have had that experience of playing with Bill Evans? Even if it was one song. Yeah. This guy did more as a pianist in, in a jazz trio f to support a bass player. Could you imagine like him comping behind my bass solo? I'd probably just like puke or something because yeah. I'd be so scared. <laughs> What an amazing experience to be able to play with someone like that. You know, he, he did more for the upright bass player than anybody, you know, as a soloist, yet still a bass player, because you still got to play the role of the bass. You know, I mean, we play bass for a reason. We love playing time. We love playing the bass. The soloing is just the icing on the cake, but nobody hires you to solo unless it's your own band. <laughs> they hire you to play the job of a bass player. So even if like playing with Bill, just to walk behind him and just play with him would have been just like life changing, let alone hearing him comp behind a bass solo, you know. So th this that is connected to this record because it's Bill. And Bill did that for Mark, you know, for for Scotty. Bill did that for Mark Johnson, and in a sense, he could have done that for me if I wasn't too darn scared to do it, you know. <laughs> but um, so there's a lot of emotional calories in this record for me, be because of you know because of those connections, you know. Got you. And because this is a recorded with Bill Evans, you had Tom Zink and Charles Ruggiero. Ruggiero, yeah. Yes, they very much. I mean, it was a very balanced trio setup so this is really interesting and it's really cool and and I, I know i use the word rewarding a lot but it's the truth and it's how i feel and it's it really it's really cool for me okay mm -hmm. so you know i'm very blessed i'm fortunate i've reached a level in my career where i could call the most famous guys in the world to play on my record and they would play on my record you know because hopefully they respect my playing and more importantly they want to get paid right just like yeah, man, <laughs> hey, i can play in it oh, i hate your playing i don't care but here's the money it's like you play but yeah but the point is it's like you know you reach a point where you know most people would return my call at this point you know in the jazz world i would hope mm -hmm. you know and then it was one of the things that that when it came time to do the record you know, I asked the label in Japan, well, who would you like me to use? It's like, I'm I'm open here. It's like, this is your idea. 
<laughs> tell me who you would like me to use. Like, like, like who's, who's well known and well respected in Japan. Cause it came out in Japan first. Is there somebody specific that you hear that you would like to have play on this? I'm happy to have, you know, I'm cool, you know? And basically his response was, I don't care who the other musicians are. It's your record. It's all I care about is you, you know? So <laughs> I was like, okay, well, all right, that's fine. It's kind of weird, but okay, that's cool. I understand. I'm, I'm the artist. So people are going to, in his mind, you know, people are going to buy it because it's my record in my mind, you know, yes, it's my record and I'm the featured guy, but we're in this together. Yeah. We're a trio. We're all, we're all in it together. We're all equals. You know, it may, it may be my record, and there's bass solos and melodies and stuff, but we are complete. It is a trio. You know, there's three of us here. It ain't just me, you know. So in thinking about it, it was just like, well, man, who do I use? And it's like, I live in Los Angeles. You know, there's some cats in New York that I like to have playing it, but there's just not enough money to fly them and put them up in a hotel. All that. And it's just like, and then, you know, Tom Zink has been playing piano with me for years and years in, in, in my, my contemporary bands. And he's just a sweet cat. And he's a huge Bill Evans fan. And... So it's just like, you know, this would be great for Tom. He could use the visibility and the exposure. People don't know his playing this way. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, as a friend, you know, and somebody who loves the guy, it's like, I want people to hear a part of you that they just don't know exists because they never hear you this way. They don't understand that you're a really great musician and you that you're a lyrical player and you're a melodic player and you you have that sensibility of never overplaying and getting in the way. It's like you play musically, you listen. And I want people to hear that because they're just not used to hearing him that way. And then when it came to the drummers, I was like, well, you know, maybe I should call Joe LaBarbera because he played with Bill. He played in the trio with Bill for years. It's like, and I know Joe mm -hmm. and we play great together. It's like, maybe I should have Joe do it, you know? And then... In thinking about it, I was just like, man, I'm just, I don't, I don't know if I should, you know, you know, then, then are people going to think I'm trying too hard or am I, you know, you know, you know, whatever, I don't know. And then I did a gig with a sax player in LA, a guy named Doug Webb, who's a great jazz sax player. And he called me up and he's like, yeah, man, we're playing at this club. It's not far from where you are. You got, you got to come down and play. And it's just bass, drums and sax. And, and the drummer, you know, Charles Ruggiero, he's great. You're going to love playing with him. He's a New York guy, you know, just come do the gig. So I don't know him. I said, I don't care. Whatever. I want to go play and have fun. So I just went and did it. I'd, I'd never heard of Charles. I didn't know. Yeah. So we get there, we play. And literally within the first four bars of the first tune, <laughs> it was like, all right, this is a cat. Because <laughs> he's got the New York sensibility, the old school New York sensibility that I grew up with because mm -hmm. of my background and my father being a, a drummer from New York, you know, and me growing up playing drums. He's got the New York thing. We hit it off immediately, like immediately, and the time was right, and I didn't even think twice about it. It was just like, all right, that's it. And so he he was a drummer, and now we've made the record, and we've been doing gigs, and it's it's wonderful. And, and it's just – I think the thing about it that's really cool is – and I'm not saying this – I'm not saying this as a criticism or putting down my own record, but it's a really easy to listen to real jazz record. The playing is real. Mm -hmm. The artistry is real. There's no fluff. There's nothing fake. There's no overdubs. There's, it's a real, live, beautiful jazz record that is actually pretty easy to listen to. It doesn't mean it's not musical. It's just there's not a lot of wasted gymnastics and pyrotechnics and crazy virtuoso, like, just because you can do it. It's really a musical record, and both Charles and Tom – are incredibly musical musicians. Mm -hmm. And I think they really make the record better because it's nothing is overdone, nothing is overplayed, and everybody's listening. And I think that really comes across in, in the music where it truly sounds like an ensemble. It, it, and, and it doesn't sound like a bass player record. I mean, even though I play melodies and solo, it still doesn't sound like a bass player record. It sounds like a nice trio record where everybody's got a voice. And I think in the end result of all of this long blurb here is that's probably what I'm the most proud of is because it really does sound like a cohesive musical unit. And it's not one person's ego. It's like, we're just playing jazz. We're playing great. We're just playing great tunes, you know? And I think that's probably what I'm proud of the most of the record is how musical it is. Nice. Well, and one thing that I know we talked about a little back in 2018, and I've always been in admiration is how you managed to get such a clear sound recording upright 
I, I think you're like the golden standard. If anybody wants to record upright, they should talk to you because I, I heard so, such clarity and such detail and so much color. I mean, it, it's like taking off a blindfold to see. I mean, it's just amazing. Well, thank you. That, that, that means the world to me. You know, it's like <clears throat> I am incredibly fortunate and incredibly blessed to have an instrument that taught me how to play. I, I have over a 300-year-old Italian bass. I've had it since I was 16 years old. And I, I couldn't even start playing that bass for probably two years, two and a half years that I had it because I just wasn't good enough to play it. I had I had another bass at the time when I was playing with Horace Silver and and other other great artists that I would tour with. I had a beautiful Czech bass. And unfortunately, I, I needed the money, so I sold it because I had I had my Italian bass. I had another bass. It was like I need the money. I got to sell my bass, which I really regret selling that bass. It's a great bass, but I couldn't even play my Italian bass because it was just too good for me. I wasn't ready for it, and it wasn't until and and I this is coming from my heart. This is the truth. I just was not good enough and mature enough to play that bass. Because once I started playing that bass, that bass taught me how to get a sound. Mm -hmm. That bass taught me how to play in tune. That bass taught me how to be clear. Because it is so, that bass is so clear and so clean. You know, it's, 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 most upright basses are a lot louder and a lot bigger and a lot more exciting and a lot more vibrant. That bass isn't acoustically, but it is so precisely clean and clear and so frighteningly even from the bottom to the top mm -hmm. that it taught me how to play it and to learn how to get a sound out of it because I had to learn how to pull a sound out of the instrument. I couldn't just play it. Other guys that have played it, they just take and go, Pin, and they can't get a sound out of it. And these are guys that are 10 times stronger than me. <laughs> they cannot get a sound out of it. And then I pick it up and I get a sound out of it because it taught me how it needed to be played. So in the process of this whole experience, because it forced me to be clean and accurate and finesse and touch and, and awareness and intonation, because it taught me all of this, when I record, it comes, you really hear that because, because let me tell you something is something that I've learned from a lifetime of doing this is that your sound is here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's it. And I don't care what amp you use. I don't care how much money it costs. I don't care what speakers you use. I don't care how much money it costs. You know, you can have the greatest rig in the world. If you don't have a good sound, all that great rig is going to do is make your bad sound really loud. <laughs> right? Your sound is your relationship with your instrument, period. Which is why when I practice electric bass, I don't plug it in. When I practice acoustic bass, I don't plug it in. This is your sound. So a lifetime of developing a sound, learning how to create a sound and being obsessed with intonation and focus and where to put your finger and the preciseness of how to put your finger and playing clean. It's like it's impossible to play 16th note bebop lines if you're not clean mm -hmm. and precise, right? And I don't want it to be a bunch of noise. Sometimes you hear these cats is just like playing all this crazy fast stuff and it's cool. You can't hear one note. You just hear all this, all this you know, it's like, a, you know, cool, fine. That's not what I wanted to. Yeah. I want you to hear every note I play, whether it's the right note or the wrong note. I still want you to hear it, you know, <laughs> because the whole point is to play what you hear and not just make a bunch of noise. So that bass really taught me how to play clean and precise. So when you record it, you're recording clean and precise. And the mics I use are very clean and precise mics. You know, I use a deep, I use DPA mic is my main mic and it's not anywhere near as boomy as like an old tube mic, which sounds phenomenal. I love old tube mics and this is a tube mic as well. It's actually tube or solid state, but it's new tech, newer technology. Gotcha. And it doesn't have the, 
that the older mics have, mm -hmm. which I love. The problem with that is you don't get the clarity. You don't hear the note. You hear the woof of the note. So what I do is I use my DPA mic, which is really clean and really accurate and really precise. They used to be the guys who designed those used to work for, I believe, B and K and like made test equipment and 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 micro, you know, industrial microphones and things like that that had to be like perfect. That's why they're so clean and clear, right? And then I'll I'll get like a D112 or I'll get like some funky kick drum mic or something to get the woof out of it. And I'll literally record with two mics that are completely polar opposite. I'll make sure they're in phase. I'll put them right next to each other so there's no time alignment issues, right? So then I can dial in how much woof I want from the, the kick drum mic, you know, and how much clarity I want from the D DPA. And with those two, you get a nice balance of warmth and support, but clarity. So when you play a fast 16th note line, you still hear every note. And that to me is really important. So it's just, it's just from years of doing it and years of trying to learn how to get a sound out of my instrument and getting and being accurate. I want to be accurate with what I play. I want you to hear every note and the notes better damn well be in tune or as close as possible because I've got no excuse to play out of tune. No. <laughs> I saw Itzek Perlman play Paganini <laughs> with an instrument that's got the string length of a big shoe with fingers the size of sausages, up in thumb position where you do this on a violin and you just went up a third, and he's playing this crazy stuff and he's perfectly in tune. And I was 16 years old and I'm watching Itzhak Perlman play the hardest repertoire on the planet, perfectly in tune with a smile on his face, and that changed my life forever. Because it's like, if this guy can play in tune on a violin, then when you look down in low position on a bass, this one four is a whole step? Yeah. F to a G? Man, I ain't got no excuse on the planet to play out of tune when that's the whole step. When you do this, you don't hear any difference, right? It's like he changed my life, and I've focused on and made it a priority to play in tune and be focused and accurate. So, so it all adds up to the recorded sound. I know I'm kind of rambling, but it's all connected because, remember, the microphones pick up what you do, Right. All they do is pick up what you do. So if your sound ain't happening, the microphone's a really good mic. You know, $5,000 microphone is going to record your bad sound, right? Absolutely. That's how I think about it, is that you, you have to deliver, let the technology record what you're delivering. And then the end result is, is hopefully a nice warm sound that's clean and clear, and, and your playing is in tune, and it's cool. That's, that's how I think about it. Very nice. Well, that's what totally came across and again i think i didn't miss a note because they were all so present and so crisp and so lovely but we could obviously go on and on but we should talk what's in the in the works for the future brian what what do you have planned coming up well the record comes out april 5th mm -hmm. and it's also exciting for me because i'm putting it out myself so it's neat it's like i'm the i'm, I'm my label you know but it's the real deal i'm I'm hiring the right people. You know, I've been in the business a long time. I'm actually a co-owner of a label. So, you know, I'm not, it's not anything that I don't know, but it's really cool to be involved from the ground up and actually own it and, and, and understand it. And the downside is I got to pay for it. <laughs> but the good side is, is that it's, it's just really neat. You feel again, more connected to, to, to the project. So it comes out April 5th. We're starting to do some gigs. We've got some gigs in the LA area. I'm trying to book an East Coast tour now for the fall. There are some, there's two videos that are on my channel right now, my YouTube channel of the trio. I don't know if you saw those yet. Mm -hmm. And then I've got seven more, six or seven more, six more, I think, videos that are going to come out over the next several months after the record's out. We did a bunch of the stuff live, that trio. So I'm going to try to do that as much as possible and, and hope we can get some gigs. You know, it's just so much fun to play with the, with the trio. We've got two nights at Catalina Jazz Club in Los Angeles, May, uh, May 17 and 18. We're doing July um, 10 at Vibrato in Beverly Hills. We're doing July 25th at uh, Campus Jacks in Orange County and down 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 there. So we're we're booking more stuff. We'll do we'll do the Grape in Ventura, and then I'm trying to book outside of California and 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 outside of the LA area and 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 travel with the trio. And it'll just be incredibly fun to play this music live. On the polar opposite side of this is um, I just have a new single come out of my contemporary record, The Magic of Moonlight, that just hit radio last week. And that's exciting. And we've got more gigs, you know, with that funky band coming up. And it's really, 
it's wonderful. You know, the Berks Jazz Festival and going to Indonesia to play the Java Jazz Festival. And it's, it's, it's cool. These projects are so polar opposite different that it's, it's really a joy because you completely go to a different world. So when I go play the funky stuff, my head is totally into that and the groove and, and, and all that. And then when I go play the jazz, it's like I just leave all that behind and I go into that world. And it's just so nice. And, and to me, it's just balance. You know, it's like it just it, it's just wonderful to be able to experience the, the, the different genres of jazz and to experience the two different instruments, which is acoustic bass and electric bass, you know. And for me, I love them both. And it's and I'm a writer. So when I write music, my heart's in it, you know. So even though it's contemporary fucky stuff and it's on, you know, watercolors and smooth jazz radio, man, I'm blessed they're playing my music. You know, it's an honor. Are you kidding me? They don't have to play my music. They can play other people's music and they're playing my music. That's a big deal, you know, and and I get to do it as a bass player. So I love the balance of kind of like having two different careers at the same time. And it's going to be a trip, man, because I'm going to have two completely different styles of records out at the same time. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens. You know, maybe I'll end up on the charts at the same time, you know, with two different things. Or then it's like you try to book a gig where it's like, well, am I doing the jazz trio or am I doing the funky stuff? It's like, you know, so that's, that's a place I've never been before. But just the fact that I at least have the opportunity to do it is wonderful. So that's what I'm going to be working really hard on. And one other thing about the Lafar record that, that I, I, I want to say that, also makes it incredibly special for me is Scott's sister, Helene Lafaro Fernandez. She's in her eighties. Wow. And she's a writer. She, she actually did a biography on Scott and she inter she interviewed me for that years ago, which was another thing about credibility of that world where she didn't have to interview me. Who the heck am I? And she interviewed me for, for his book. So that made a lot to me that she felt that I had, you know, was one of the guys, let's put it that way. And she would come when I would play in LA and play when, when it was a jazz gig where she knew I was playing upright, she would always, you know, she would come to the gigs and we would always have just a wonderful connection. And, and, and it's like, it's, this is Scott LaFaro's sister, man. I mean, she grew up with the guy. It's like, this is pretty cool. Right? So the first phone call I made when I agreed to do this record was to her. Hmm. And it's like, you've got to be involved in this. It's like, I'm doing a record for your brother. You have to be involved in this record. So we spent a lot of time back and forth with emails, a lot of time on the phone. She'd come to my gig. She told me all these incredible stories about Scott and her family and her dad, which so many were actually reminded me of my dad and my family and the music in the house and things like that. And just all these great stories of her relationship with Scotty and I just felt so connected to Scott and to the music and to what this record means because I felt like I jumped into her family and I jumped in, I, I jumped into their life in these conversations and in this. And I said, you have to write something for, you know, for, for the record. So she, she wrote a really beautiful statement in the, in the artwork for the, uh, on the, in, in the, on the CD. Um, she made just a, a really beautiful statement for me that when I, when she sent it to me, I read it, I literally was like, I started crying. I, I, I lost it, you know, and it just, from a credibility standpoint, you know, she was there. She yeah. witnessed everything. She experienced his ups and his downs with him, and they were very close. And it just meant so much to me to have her involvement, and it made me feel like like this was the right thing to do for the right reason, and because it really wasn't about me. It just it made it very rewarding for me, where I feel like okay, I'm not just doing another jazz trio record because who cares? I mean, I just assumed just go listen to the Bill Evans trio. Why do I need to make a jazz trio record? Nobody cares, you know. Mm -hmm. But now there's a reason to care yeah. because now I feel connected to it, and there's a reason to do it. And her involvement made it so much more real for me, you know. So that's so there's a lot of depth in this project in many different ways and a lot of connections in my world. And that's just really special. So I'm, I'm thrilled to get it out to the world. I hope people love it. I, I hope they get it for what it is versus tearing it apart for what it's not. You know, you know how people can be, you know, they'll shred you because you didn't do X, Y, and Z. It was like, you're right. I didn't do X, Y, and Z because that's not what I do and who I am. Why don't you listen for it for ABC instead of X, Y, Z yeah, and just yeah. enjoy it for what it is instead of tearing me apart because for what it's not, you know? So I just want people to listen to it with their ears and not their eyes, you know, and just listen to the music and get where it's coming from and just, you know, hope you dig it. You know, that's for me, that's, that's all I could ask for. 
And if people want to know where you're going to be, because you've got so much going on, brianbromberg.net. Correct. My website, Facebook, you know, Instagram, you know, the other, what's the other new one? The, the um, threads, whatever, you know, yeah. but basically my website, Instagram, Facebook, you know, basically pretty much has everything. And, and I always post all my gigs. Bands in town's great. You know, I always post all my gigs and things like that. And come check it out. And uh, if you guys check out the record, I hope you like it. And if you see me at a club near you, come say hello. Absolutely. Well, Brian, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us and mm -hmm. to share La Faro, which is, again, a magnificent album. People, you have to hear it. Thank you. You'll love it. I'm, I'm glad you like I it. I know I do. Well, thanks. And you listen to a lot of music and you know a lot of bass players. So for me, you know, when you say it's cool, you know, I, I that gives me a nice vote of confidence because I know I know I know you know what you're listening to. So thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, folks, you've seen him here on Bass Musician Magazine, Brian Bromberg. Thanks, man. Take care, everybody. <laughs>